Okay. So for those of you joining in, watching this later, my name is Scott McCormick, and this is the Articulate class of the Gospel of John. We're just going to be studying the Bible. We may end up on other things later, but right now we're studying the Gospel of John, and we're in John chapter 3, where we've been studying a conversation that Jesus has with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. So before we dive in, I'd like for us to reread the entire conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus so we have full context. And then we'll do a little review and then look at the little bit that we're going to talk about today. So how about we go in order on my screen, Katie, Matt, Alyssa, you three are up first. Katie, if you'll read John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Matt, if you'll read 9 through 15. And Alyssa, if you'll please read 16 through 21. And Claudia, you'll have plenty of read to read later. So don't, don't feel bad. Mm -hmm. All right, Katie, if you'll go first, please. Yes. And I'm sorry, it's chapter 3, one through, verses 1 through 8? That's correct. Perfect. Thank you. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no reason can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the God's, in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Very good. So who are our main characters in this conversation? Jesus and Nicodemus. Jesus and Nicodemus. Now, it's not unlikely that his disciples were also there with him when Nicodemus came to, to see him, but they're not mentioned. And they don't speak. We just see Nicodemus and Jesus's conversation here. Sorry. And what do we know about Nicodemus? He's the ruler of the Jews. Right. Jesus calls him. He's he's a ruler of the Jews, ruler or teacher of the Jews. Good. What else? He's a Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. Now, a Pharisee as opposed to what other ruling party in the Jewish leadership? Uh, as opposed to Sadducee. Yep, as opposed to Sadducees. And what, what, what's different between these two parties? 
What made him a Pharisee and another guy a Sadducee? Uh, the Pharisees were very focused on the law and believed in righteousness by works. That's right. Focused on the law. Are you reading your notes? Yes, I am. Good girl. <laughs> That's right. And they focused on a righteousness by works. Righteousness is such a long word, right? Righteousness by works. Very good. Now, as opposed to Sadducees, these were guys that believed that there was no afterlife, no resurrection from the dead. As a result, they didn't believe in other spiritual beings, no angels. They didn't believe in anything other than the first five books of the Bible. And they were very materialistic. They were seeking rewards in this life, as opposed to the Pharisees who sought rewards in the next life, but by doing so under their own willpower, under their own strength. And here Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, likely either because he was afraid of what others would think or because he just wanted some intimate time for the two of them to talk, whereas Jesus during most of the day was crowded by all sorts of people coming up to him because of the signs that he did. And after his sort of introductory statement to Jesus, Jesus hits him with a hard truth, and he starts it with this phrase that we're going to see again today, truly, truly, and why does he repeat that word? What does that mean when he says it like that? It's, it's an emphasizer. Sorry. Yeah, it, it's, it's emphasized. It's raised to the next level. This is similar to what we saw in the book of Isaiah when Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne. He was given a vision of the throne room of God, and around the throne were the angels of God who were singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. The holiness of God was lifted up to that third level. Here, the truth of this statement is lifted up to a, to a second level. This is a very true statement. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. This is a necessary condition. Or born from above is another way to interpret that Greek. And both are true here. This is a second birth. This is a spiritual spiritual birth or a supernatural birth and this this being born again the theological word for that is regeneration regeneration it's sort of like if um this is a this is a bad example but i'm going to use it anyway it's sort of like if you go to pick up a lizard and its tail falls off and then its tail grows back. Sometimes we say that it regenerates. So here, this is something that has to happen inside you, a growing, a birthing, a, a something that happens to you on the inside, and it's done to you by the Spirit. And Nicodemus's response is, what? I, what? It, he gets this, he gets this frown on his face with question marks like this and says, how can a man be born when he is old? And he asks this question, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus turns those words right back around on him. In verse 5, he says, truly, truly, there's that truly, truly again. I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter. He repeats that word. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. So here we see that you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. In our natural fallen state, we are under spiritual blindness and spiritual inability. There's something we can't see and something we can't do unless one is born again. Then he gives an example of the wind. Who remembers this example of the wind? There's a word in the Greek that means wind. Who remembers what that word is in the Greek? Pneumo. Pneuma. Pneumo. Pneuma. 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 It's sort of an onomatopoeia word. On, if, if, you're, if you're very lofty, you say it's an onomatopoeic word. It's, 
it's a word that sounds like what it is. It's got a very breathy <laughs> pneuma word to it. So the wind is the pneuma. Well, that's also the Greek word for spirit. And he's been talking to Nicodemus about the spirit's work of regeneration in new believers. And so here he draws a parallel between the spirit and the wind. And he says, look, even if you're a really smart guy, you might be a meteorologist. You've studied this your whole life. But when the wind comes rushing by you, you can't look up and say, look, that's where it came from. That's where it's going. You don't know. Now, you know there was wind. The trees are blowing. The kites are flying. I've tried to fly a kite for the last two weeks. My son's kite still won't get it up in the air. There's not enough wind. And I don't get that. I want the wind to happen when it happens, when I want it to happen. And he says, so, so there's two parallels we want to see here. One, the wind in this sense is incomprehensible. What does that word mean? Can't understand it. Can't, can't understand it. Know does it. it mean you can't understand anything about it? Or does it mean you can't wrap your mind around it entirely? Mm -hmm. It's the latter of those two. It means I may understand that there is wind. We've got a word for it. I can see it happening. I can say it has to do with pressure differentials in the atmosphere and be very technical about it. But I can't totally wrap my mind around it. I can't see all the wind in the whole world and what it's doing and predict what's going on. So it is with the spirit. God is infinite. We are finite. There are things about God we will never be able to grasp, but he has revealed himself to us so that we can believe in him, even though we don't have to totally wrap our minds around him to believe in him. The second parallel here is that the spirit is sovereign. The wind blows where it wants to. The spirit moves where he wants to. He is a person with a will who does his own thing. We've been talking about the new birth back in chapter one, that, that you were born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, that this is God's will, that this should happen, and he does it when he wants to. So that's where we finished up last week, was with this picture of the wind. And Nicodemus's response now changes a little bit. He had that frown on his face, and now he's sort of like, wow, I, I'm, I'm sort of blown away by what you're teaching me here. I, these are things that I've never heard of. Claudia, reread for me. You're going to get to read a lot more than this, but reread for me his response in verse 9 to what Jesus is teaching. So he, his response is, Are you the, the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Oh, that's, that's verse 10. I mean Nicodemus' response. How can these things be? How can these things be? He's... he's, he's marveling now at this point. This has nothing to do with superheroes. This is sort of like a wonderment. This is, um, he's sort of in awe of what Jesus is telling him. And, and so then you rightly say in verse 10, Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? <laughs> he uses this phrase, teacher of Israel. And we've been talking about how as a ruler of the Jews, Nicodemus was likely a member of the Sanhedrin. This was the ruling body of the Jewish community. And at the top of the Sanhedrin, there were three main positions. Uh, one was more of a teaching position. Their job was to exposit scripture, to get it out and actually teach the people. One was more of an administrative position. There was another that was more of a, a, a wisdom position. They were an advisor. And in these three different roles, um, and Nicodemus could possibly have been one of those. But calling him a teacher of Israel is, at the very least, pointing to his role as being someone who's supposed to understand Scripture and explain it to the people. And if you're going to explain it, you better know it really well. And he's trying to tell Nicodemus that the things he's teaching him are not new. They're in the Old Testament. These concepts of a new birth, this concept of the Spirit— uh, this concept of the sovereignty of God and salvation. These are all captured in the Old Testament, and Nicodemus should have been aware of them. And so 
he says, you know, and then I, and then I tell you, and you're giving me these question marks and you're sort of marveling at this and you're not sure if you want to believe it yet. So in verse 11, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, this is that third time he said this. We've had three very true statements. Now you must be born again, unless you're born of water and the spirit. And now he says, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Well, now this is another one of those situations where like back at the beginning when Nicodemus first started this conversation, he used this word, we. He said, we know that you are a teacher come from God. And, and, and just like that time, now Jesus is using a third person plural. Uh, that's, that's wrong. First person. This is first person plural. And clearly he's including himself in this. But like my wife would say, what, what do you have a rat in your pocket? What are you talking about? Who's this we? So I, I've read multiple commentators on this this week. And every single one of them had an opinion about what the we was. And every single one of them said it was a different we. So there was uh, Jesus and his disciples, probably, who were standing there. They all bore witness and testimony. Maybe it was Jesus and John the Baptist. This is the guy who came before him. Nicodemus likely saw him and what he was doing, things like that. Everybody's heard about John the Baptist those days. Maybe it was Jesus and the rest of the Trinity. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Maybe it's Jesus using the, um, the royal we, sort of like we know these things in, the, in a way to say one must know these things. It's sort of like in a, 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 a superior way to say we, but really you. Okay, so, so which one of those is it? Well, it doesn't say, and that's okay, because that's not really the point of that sentence. The point here is he is He's saying, look, we are bearing witness. In some translations, you'll see this word testimony. In both of these cases, this is that, that those legal words being used again, that the, the gospel of John is sort of laid out as a legal defense of who Christ is and why you should trust and believe in him. And so he's saying, we bear witness to what we know and have seen, but you don't receive this testimony. You're rejecting our testimony. Now, in a court of law, when you give witness or you bear testimony, it's because you're expected to be an authority on a given subject. So one example of that is a crime happened and you saw it. That gives you eyewitness testimony to that. Another way for you to, to have authority to give testimony in a court of law is, let's say you're an expert on a particular subject that's related to what they're discussing in the court. So my, my mom has done, uh, she's a CPA and she has a friend who's a nurse and she's helped her with taxes for her business and things like that. And this friend who's a nurse doesn't actually do work as a nurse in a doctor's office. She is an expert in the field of nursing and she gives expert testimony in legal court cases. That's her job. That's what she does. So in both of those cases, there's sort of like this authoritative component to this. And Jesus is now going to give a defense for his authority on these things. So let's continue reading. Um, let's see here. Claudia, you haven't read enough yet. If you will read for me John chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Okay, in 12 and 13, if I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Very good. So he says, look, I've been telling you about earthly things. Well, what are these earthly things that Jesus has been telling him about up until this point? He, he says, all, all of this stuff is earthly things. So like, just summarize, off the top of your head, we've been studying this conversation for a couple of weeks. What are the topics that Jesus has been talking about with Nicodemus? Uh, being anything that's born of the flesh is flesh and born of the spirit is spirit. He's talking about. So he's talking about the difference between the, the first birth and the new birth? Right. Good. 
What else? There's a, there's a word picture that's that play on words between the word spirit and wind. And what's that all about? He's also talking about signs. Well, they, they talked a little bit about signs. In the sure. beginning, because we, we end in chapter two with um, Jesus saying that he didn't trust himself to them because their faith was based on signs. Nicodemus comes into the chapter three, going right back to the same thing. We know you're a man of God or believe you're a man of God because of signs. Mm -hmm. Those yep. are earthly things. Yep. Yep. So signs uh, happen on earth. We've also got the operation of the spirit or the work of the spirit on earth among men in your hearts. And he, he contrasts this with heavenly things. So if we've covered this stuff that's, that's temporal, it happens down here on earth. This is all stuff that it, we've even got this great picture of the wind talking about the incomprehensibility of it and the sovereignty of it. What if I told you about what the throne room of God looked like? What if I sang for you the words that the angels use when they sing to praise God? What if I described for you all of the many individual rooms and mansions in my father's house? What if I told you about the infinite love and oneness that I have with my Father and with the Spirit. If you can't believe these things, this is little compared to all of those things. So we've got to get over this. You, you've got, this is, this is like basic stuff for you before I can start teaching you about the real stuff, is what he's trying to say. There's this big question mark over here until we can get this bit. And so he says, you know, you, we've been bearing witness, and you're rejecting that. And if we can't, if you're rejecting that, I can't even teach you about the really complex stuff. And then in verse 13, he makes a very interesting statement. No one has ascended into heaven. I'm going to draw heaven up here like it's a big cloud, this big nebulous thing. So forgive me, for that's my stick figure heaven. No one has ascended into heaven. I'm going to draw an arrow up except he who descended from heaven. And who is that? Who descended from heaven, it says? It says the Son of Man. The Son of Man. The Son of Man is Jesus' favorite phrase for himself. This is a reference to the book of Daniel. That's where the Son of Man is first used in, in the Bible. And he's referring to himself here. And why is he saying no one has ascended except he who descended? Really, this is a roundabout way of saying, if I want to tell you about heavenly things and about spiritual things, and you're questioning my authority on that, there's this axiom where, you know, for you to be able uh, to give an eyewitness testimony to something, you actually had to have seen it. You had to have been there when it happened. Well, guess what? Jesus has been there when it happened. He was in heaven. So he is an authority on these things because no man on this whole earth, no man, woman, or child had ever ascended into heaven to then be able to come back down and tell us about these things. But Jesus, question. say that again? I have a question. Yes. So there's a couple of different ways that Jesus is referred to. And sometimes you'll see as son of God. Mm -hmm. And right here is son of man. Yep. And, and that's not an accident. It's on purpose. And I, I know it, it is, it's in the, um, they use both, but one is to really resemble divinity that he was all God, but he was also all man. Mm -hmm. and in this case, descended from heaven, you would think that that would be the son of God, not necessarily the son of man. I'm just curious as your take on that. Oh, sure. So that's actually a good lead into a point that I wanted to make. Now, um, my, my Bible at the end of verse 13 has a footnote. Mine has a footnote. And if yours has a footnote, go down and read it. I'll read you mine. 
Mine's footnote number six. Some manuscripts add who is in heaven. In other words, he's saying no one has, except he who descended, the son of man who is in heaven. There's this phrase there. Now, when it says some manuscripts, that's referring to source texts. That's one of the things that we call that. The source texts are like the original Hebrew, the original Greek. We're talking about really old scrolls, the paper that we go back to and go, all right, this is the authority. And we have literally thousands of copies of source texts that are used and compared and translated and studied in order to give us as accurate of an English translation as we could. And some manuscripts include that phrase and some don't. If you were reading a King James Bible, it would include that phrase in the main text. I have an ESV and it's included in a footnote. Now, why is this phrase important? I want us to notice the tense of this verb. Who yeah, it's, is? It's, it's present tense, but that's like all the more so. Yeah. To think it's son of God because it's, it's the divinity part from mm -hmm. heaven and present tense. It's son of man was babe who was born in the manger and the, the, guy who taught in the temples and taught son of God is divinity and is in heaven. So um, I'm just curious why son of man was used here. Yeah. So son of man is more than just the fact that he was descended from, um, from, um, from a man. There's a reference to it in the old Testament that I want to find real quick. Um, really thought, Um, there's references in the book of Daniel, and I tell you what, I'll have to study that this week and, and give you a, a better answer to that, but it has more to do with what the Son of Man was referring to in the Old Testament than just that he was descended from an actual human. That, that's the best answer I can give right now. I'll have to look it up and, and probably answer that better. Um, yes, he is. Th th this is one of the points. This is present tense. He's standing in front of Nicodemus, referring to himself and then saying that he is also in heaven presently. Well, if he's standing in front of Nicodemus, how is he also in heaven presently? It's not just that he came down from heaven. No, this is saying he's there and he's here. Sort of a hint. I almost gave it away. Yeah, I some... think it depends on where you're going, but I, I don't think that Jesus himself, uh, as the second person of the Trinity, is omnipresent. So I, I'm not sure that after the incarnation, you, you can't separate his essence. Uh, I, I'd say that right now Jesus is reigning in heaven, but Jesus is not present right here. The Spirit is here. But I guess I question, depending on how you're going to interpret the yeah. who is in heaven, I'm not sure that's saying that Jesus is in front of Nicodemus and in heaven. So this is a hard thing for us to grasp, because uh, when we talk about Jesus as the second part of the Trinity, when before creation, before up until the point where he was born as a baby, conceived in Mary's womb, he was fully God. He's God of very God. He's not a created being. He's not second in the order of creation to God. He's second in order of persons within the Trinity, um, but he is fully God. When he was conceived, something happened. He was then at that point also fully man. Now, there are certain creeds and confessions that were developed over time to talk about how does this work? How does it work for him to be fully God and fully man? Does that mean that he's a man that's sort of like a superman? He's got supernatural powers? Or does that mean that there's sort of like two of him? Well, that's not what we think either. 
And so if you go and study back some of these, um, and I forget what they're called, but they, they would get together for these large conferences and debate this for at length. And then they would write down what they believe based on scripture to be true about Christ's person, that the idea here is that he's both at the same time without mixture. In other words, the attributes of him as God, things like his omnipresence and his omnipotence and his um, omniscience, he is everywhere. There's nothing that can actually contain him. He's can do anything because he's all powerful. He knows all things. These are all still true in that he's fully God, but the man standing in front of Nicodemus doesn't have that stuff mixed in. He's not omnipresent. He's standing in one place. He's not omnipotent. He can't lift a rock that's so big because he's a man. He's not omniscient but he can be revealed things. Things can be communicated to him by the part of him that's God. This is sort of like really hard for us to wrap our minds around because you and I are not like that. We are finite. We're just one. When we talk about, you know, being married to a person, we say that they're of one flesh, but my wife and I are of two minds and her attributes don't transfer to me. And we can't even really be considered as one person, except when we just, when we talk about the concept of marriage. But with Jesus, he didn't actually leave heaven. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. He is still omnipresent, even though the part of him that is man was standing in front of Nicodemus. Which is sort of mind-blowing to me. Now, did Jesus die, buried, raised on the third day, and then came an ascension when his body was raised up to heaven? Yes, that did happen. And in that sense, his body is now up there, standing before the Father. But he, Jesus as God, and God is immutable. This is another one of those words we talked about early on in this class. And he's immutable. He didn't lose these attributes for this to happen. Does that make sense? I'm gonna. This is another thing I'm gonna have to go back and and look up this week because I'm not sure that I agree. If that's if that's the interpretation, then what does it mean when Jesus is telling his apostle or his disciples uh, of the coming of the Holy Spirit, and that if he does not leave them, then the Helper would not come. And, and yeah, and too, and I'm not trying to like, mm -hmm. but another point of confusion is there is. He's calling himself the son of man here. Mm -hmm. I think it's just definitely worth digging into, but there's other times where he's calling himself the son of God. And they're very specific times, so much so that the Jews use that as a reason to crucify him because of right. blasphemy. Right. And so in this case, when we're, we're going back to the context, we're going back to our discussion with Nicodemus here and trying to understand the born again um, conversation. And he's very specifically saying the son of man, but it, it's a little confusing because he's, he's talking about heaven and descending and he's the only one who has, the only one who has descended is the one who has ascended, which is him. I, I don't know, for me, I'm, I'm confused because that points to divinity, that points to the omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, like that part of it, not mm -hmm. the, Son of, so why didn't he use the son of God here instead of the son of man? Um, I know son of man means he was physically present with that. And, and we're not talking about post-resurrection now. We're talking pre-resurrection. But I, I'm, not quite, I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the, the difference and, and how, why and how it's being used that way here, especially what we're talking about ascending and descending. Sure, sure. I, I will definitely look up this week about the phrase, the son of man. I've studied that in the past. And honestly, I wish I could give you a better answer right now. So it's, I'll look that up. One. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, and I may study this and, and find out that I'm wrong. I don't think it has to do with pointing to his manhood versus pointing to his godhood. I think it's it referencing 
things in Old Testament scriptures that were talking about him and the phrase used in those Old Testament scriptures were the son of man, that they were Old Testament prophecies about him that were unclear until he began to attribute that name to himself now as he came in the fullness of time. Usually son of man is linked back to the Adamic nature. Son of Adam is a son of man. And it might have any, something to do with the curse. So I don't know, it's worth all of us looking into. Son of man is usually um, a lineage of Adam. Mm. And, but again, I, the, the context here with ascending and descending into heaven is just confusing. I don't want to take too much time, but it's- No, that's fine. These are good questions. So I definitely want to look it up before I come back focusing, next time. Right? Yeah. Sweet. So, all right. Well, we've got just a few minutes and I want to make sure we make it to the end of this paragraph. So if y'all are all right with that, we'll do these last two verses. So he, he makes this claim about why he has authority to teach these things. It's because he actually is from heaven. And so in verse 14 now, he's going to paint another word picture, another analogy for Nicodemus to understand. In verse 14, it says, And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, here he's talking about this serpent being lifted up in the wilderness. And this is in reference to a portion of Scripture that at that time they would not have associated as being anything messianic, that this would not have pointed forward to the Christ. And Jesus is now making parallels between that story and what's going to happen for him. And so I want us to go back to the book of Numbers, chapter 21, and actually read this story. Numbers 21. So keep a finger in John, and let's go back to Numbers. Numbers is one of the first five books of the Old Testament. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, let's see, Katie, I'm on page 129. 129 is Numbers 21. So this is in that time in Israel's history when they were wandering through the wilderness. And they were getting in trouble with God all the time, always complaining about one thing or another. And even Moses is having a hard time following what God's told him to do. Just one page before in chapter 20 is when God tells him to take his staff and then go speak to a rock and it would produce water for the people to drink. And instead Moses goes up and says, shall we bring water out of this rock for you? And he strikes the rock and disobedient to what God had told him to do, not bringing glory to God, but instead to himself and for that reason, Moses was disallowed from entering the promised land. Well, not long after that is where we're going to be in chapter 21. And I'm going to start reading in verse 4 of chapter 21. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So imagine what's happening here. I'm, I'm going to draw a small selection of the Israelites. They're wandering through the desert going this way and that way. And they've grown impatient about, uh, these, are, these stick figures are degenerating here. They're growing impatient and they're complaining and bickering. And we think, man, those Israelites were such whiners. But promise you, if you go look on Facebook, you'll find out Israelites are a really great picture of what we look like, okay? So we're no better. They were super whiners and God sends these fiery serpents among the people to bite them, and those who were bit died. They died because they complained. Think about that for a second. When's the last time you complained about something? For me, it was today. 
<laughs> I could say okay. well, pretty often. Today. It was probably multiple times today. They died as a result. And so they get the picture real fast. Let's keep reading in verse 7. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So Moses goes and prays, and he goes and makes, well, hold please, lost the zoom here. Boom. So he goes and prays, and God tells him, take a, take a pole and make this bronze serpent on it. That sort of looked familiar. That's my stick figure version. And if anyone is bitten, he can look at it, and he will not die. And Jesus is now making a parallel between that image and himself on the cross. As the snake in the wilderness, as the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will not perish. Now, what are some of the parallels that we can see here? Well, A, there's the obvious being lifted up onto a pole. Jesus is lifted onto the cross as the snake was lifted up. Another thing to note here is that this, this serpent, it wasn't a poisonous serpent. It was a bronze serpent. It didn't have any poison in it. But it was made in the image of, it took on the form of the poisonous serpents. And Jesus, in a similar fashion, put on the cross imputed on him in that moment was all the sins of the world of everybody who would ever believe in his name. And they were punished on him. He was brought forth in the likeness of sinful flesh. He died on the cross as though he were a sinner. In the same way that this non-poisonous bronze snake was an image of a representation of the sin, or I'm sorry, of the serpents that were going amongst the people. And they had to look to it. They had to have faith that if they looked to it, they would be saved. In the same way, when we look to the cross, it's not just a fact that we believe in. There is saving faith in the power of Christ to save us in that moment. That we trust in his ability to save us from the wrath of God for our sins. Now, there's a question that I want to ask you that's timely, but it's awkward. The snake bit the people, the, the serpents went amongst the people and bit them, and they said, pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents. Did God take away the serpents? No. He didn't. He didn't. Instead, he made a way for them to be saved, even though the serpents were still there. They didn't go away. This is awkward, but I've been praying a lot lately, God, please take away this coronavirus tragedy. Just make it stop. And he doesn't always do that. Sometimes he allows these tra tra tragic things to continue to happen for his glory. In this situation with the Israelites, they were saved. God was glorified as a healer and a savior of his people. And that pointed forward to now the picture Jesus is painting for Nicodemus, giving glory to him, saying, pointing back, saying, just like that happened, I'm going to do that again, and you're going to get to watch that. God may not take away this coronavirus scare. It may take a really long time for it to even die down. But that doesn't mean that he's not going to give us a way to be healed, that he's not going to give us a way to bear up under it. Being able to even have this call is one of those ways that we're bearing up under it. And I think it's appropriate for us to continue to pray that he would take it away, but trust that in his sovereignty and in his goodness, he's going to do the right thing regardless. So we can do that. Now, there's one last point that I want to make. Back in John chapter 3, Jesus uses a word in this sentence. 
when he draws this picture. I'm going to get my bookmark. Flip back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must. So must the Son of Man be lifted up. This is something that had to happen. This was not an optional thing. This was not a Jesus didn't have to die for your sins, but he just decided to and wanted to, that there might have been another way for you to be saved, but this is how he did it. No, so must the Son of Man be saved. This is not the last time he's going to say this. Flip with me quickly to Luke 24. This is the book right before John, and 24 is the very last chapter in it. So you, you only have to turn a few pages. In Luke 24, there's two places here, and I'm just going to write them down at the top, and we'll read one of them. There's verses 25 through 27, and then also verses uh, 44 through 49. And I'll read that second passage. So this is when, this is post-resurrection. Jesus has died on the cross, pierced for our transgressions, brought down, buried in a tomb for three days, raised again on uh, Resurrection Sunday, which we celebrated just last week. And then he uh, begins to appear to his disciples in his resurrected body. And they're sort of in disbelief. And he proves it to them in various ways. And then in verse 44, he says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then in verse 45, and this is something that I intentionally prayed for us today and that I, I want you to continue to pray for yourself as we study the scripture then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Spiritual truths have to be understood by a spiritually reborn person under the help and um, effort of the Spirit. So the Spirit enables us to understand the scriptures. In verse 46, he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. He said, look, all of the Old Testament, Moses, the Psalms, the prophets, all of it said that I had to come and die as a penalty for sin so that repentance and forgiveness could be given to the whole world, starting from right here in Jerusalem. This is a thing that had to happen. Now, I, I'll close with this story. I went to a school... Um, called Mercer in Macon. And when I was at school for college, the president of that school wrote a book at the time that got our Baptist college kicked out of the Southern Baptist Convention because of this book he wrote. The, the, the title of the book was, When We Talk About God, Let's Be Honest. And the point of contention was that one of the things he tried to state in the book was that Jesus didn't have to die. Well, I, I'm sorry, but over and over in this book, it said Jesus had to die. He told his disciples multiple times, look, I'm going to the cross. This is what's going to happen. Peter even tried to pull him aside one time and says, no, Lord, let, let, that, that shall never happen. And he rebuked him and said, look, he says, get behind me, Satan. This has to happen. This is the way it's got to be. This is the best way that it could have happened. Everything that God does is good and perfect and right and the best way to have done it. And that's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus here. So must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now next week we're going to get into John 3.16 and all of the surrounding scriptures there. And it's going to be awesome. And I'm excited about it. So please come back. <laughs> Any other questions before we go? I know we got we ran over just a teensy bit. This is not a question, just a comment, but um, I, I really enjoy personally when we have conversations about things like we did today regarding the Son of Man and, and just kind of talking about these intricacies. And I think it's a great challenge for us to go and over the week study that for ourselves and see mm -hmm. what we learn. Um, I personally 
have a couple of apps on my phone where I'll study um, commentary from John Calvin and Matthew Henry whenever I reach things like this where mm -hmm. um, it's very, very detailed. And I think it's a cool thing for us to come back together and each share like what we learned and compare things like that. So yeah, awesome. anyway, I really like that. Totally. We can come back next week and talk about that subject before we get into the rest of the lesson. I'd love to do that. Yeah, let's do that. Let's challenge each other, um, see what we find. Because that's the cool thing about the word, right? It's not meant to read through quickly. Sometimes you stop at something and mm -hmm. it's good. It's good to stop at something and poke at it and, and read what the word means in Greek or, you know, Hebrew or whatnot. The translations aren't exact at times and they open up a whole new world for us. But I appreciate you being open to the diversion because that's something that I've I've struggled with in the past because I've seen them used interchangeably and I know there's very different attributes for each one. And so th there was a little confusion why it was being used here in the context that it was. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll find out more altogether next week. Cool. Very cool. Thank you, Scott. I also want to immediately backtrack back into orthodoxy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I, I do think, I, I was thinking about it wrongly when I was thinking about the, the presence and absence of Jesus bodily mm -hmm. to me. And I agree that his divine nature is everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, that it's the bodily, the, the bodily present, the human nature, which is not present everywhere, which is mm -hmm. still somehow bound up in there. Um, but, but yeah, I, I want to agree that I love discussing things always in a friendly manner. Like even I would love, love it when people disagree. And I think that iron sharpens iron. Uh, and I think it's great that we can have discussions even on rabbit trails. So. Well, good. Excellent. And I want to add that for someone who is new to, new to all this, um, I appreciate you, Claudia, saying that because that's something that I just kind of didn't even acknowledge or even think deeper on. Um, to me, I just read it as is. So knowing that there are terms that can be used interchangeably and have deeper meanings is, I welcome that. So I'll keep doing that. <laughs> cool. And thank you, Scott, for also jumping back um, into and referencing past verses to kind of dig deeper on why something was said in the current verse we're in. I'm finding that really helpful. I'm taking a lot of notes too, just studying the history and, you know, previous previous stories well good and i just want to and that is the beauty of the old and new testament because the fulfillment of the old testament is in the new testament and i've had some friends that have become messianic jews which i think is the purest religion if there could be one um you know because the jews were god's chosen people and they've gone through the scriptures and ripped them apart like we're doing right now and the old testament the New Testament is all a reflection of the old, and it's really cool to see that, you yeah. know? So what, what Scott shared with us today, that's an example, that, that was really a cool reflection of, you know, Moses and the serpent in, in the desert, and then Jesus being lifted up on the cross. That's, that's, that's the beauty of the old and the new, that's cool. Yeah, I love it, I love it. Thank well, you. Thanks, thanks to each of you for being here. I love you, and I'm glad that you're here. I, and this, especially in the midst of all this time, I want to say, I love you. And if I could hug your neck, then I would. <laughs> so if we do get to still have our retreat this year, then I'll be sure to do that. Um, yeah. As long as we're not still like having six feet apart hugs, you know, but yeah. That's my default stance, just for the record. So. Six foot apart hugs. <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's fine. Not everybody, not everybody is cool with hugs and I'll shake your hand or do fist bumps or whatever. That's not a big deal. But my default is hugs now. I, I, I've decided there's a lot of people don't get enough hugs and it, it's my job to fix that. So, yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Well, then um, how about I'll close this in prayer real quick and then we'll get back to it. Dear Heavenly Father, you are so good to us, and I praise you and thank you for this time with these friends. It is wonderful to have um, a, a remote family in the body of Christ that we can spend time together with, and we're grateful for that, and we praise you. Amen. 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 Have a blessed weekend, everyone. You too. See you later. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Scott. Bye.